<laughs> you mentioned it last night, how so much of the, um, particularly specifically, the book of Revelations had just been so distorted in the contemporary tele-evangelists for anything. Right. But it seems to be happening a lot these days. Yeah. What do you comment on that, or what do you do about that? Yeah. She asked the question about uh, the televangelists, of course, and this business of revelation. Well, uh, let, me, let me say this. I think the reason that the televangelists, for example, um, can get away with this, can, in my judgment, misuse the Bible, is because those of us in the main line don't know anything about it. Uh, nature loves a vacuum, you know. <laughs> And so, if I don't know any more about the book of Revelation than allows them to step in and say this crazy stuff that they say, then it's on me. I mean, it's really on me. It's, I have to take seriously, the book of Revelation was written at a particular time in the history of early Christianity. It was written to a particular community, and it was written in a particular kind of way attempting to say one very simple thing. And that simple thing was, God wins. That's it. That's what the book of Revelation is about. That's it. Now, it does that amazingly simple thing in a very interesting and peculiar way because we don't read stuff like this anymore. In the first century, when the book of Revelation was written, there were lots of books like this, many books of what we call apocalyptic literature, which use these imageries all over the place. That is, imageries of dragons and beasts and, and uh, seals and books and all that stuff. That was common language in the first century. There were literally tens and twenties and hundreds of books like that. Now, they're all gone for most of us now. We, we have some of them available to us, but many of them, nobody reads them anymore. All we have left is the book of Revelation as the one example of this kind of writing, this apocalyptic writing. There are, in the book of Revelation, for example, 550, I tried to count this one time, about 550 overt or covert references to the Old Testament. Whoever wrote that book really knew the Old Testament and picked up all this stuff to make it help him say what he wanted to say about the need for people to make a choice between following the Roman Empire or following Jesus of Nazareth. That's the choice they had. If you follow the Roman Empire, you're going to get marked by the beast. You'll get that thing stamped on your forehead. You will be made part of the problem of the empire. The empire was evil, according to John, and it would drag people down in a terrible way. But with following of Jesus, you are able to find truth and light and hope because Jesus, ultimately, he says, that's the future of the world, not the empire of Rome. And he says it in chapter 17 and 18. He says, look, Rome's going to fall someday because all empires do. They all fall. Empires don't last forever. Christ lasts forever. Make your choice, he says. Make your choice. That's really what it's about. It's not about predicting the end of the world. <laughs> it's not about Russia and China. It's not about any of that stuff. That's just nuts. Now, I know people like that because it's a puzzle, it's a mystery and all that sort of stuff, but all these guys are just making that up. They're just making about a whole cloth and they make a pile of money doing it. I find it embarrassing, frankly, and shocking, and it makes me very uncomfortable when I hear people try to do these things and scare people to death about all this and say, oh, it's going to end. And you notice, I'm, I, I was on a radio program one time with Hal Lindsey, you know the name Hal Lindsey? Well, you know, Lindsay wrote this book, The Late Great Planet Earth, in 19... You know how many, how many copies that book sold? 27 million. Have you ever read that book? Well, before I was on this radio program, I read it because I wanted to. I found it almost impossible to read, but I did. I read it all the way through. Here's one of his arguments. Um... Hal Lindsey is a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. He was a very wealthy man by then, of course, because you sell 27 million copies of a book and make some money, right? And he did. He made some. So he's, he and I are on this program together. And I said, now, Dr. Lindsey, um, here you say on page 63 or whatever it was, I said, you said that um, the Hebrew word for head is rosh. 
That's right, it is. Which sounded to you, you said, like Russia. So, <laughs> I'm not making this up, so what he says, okay? This is this, this kind of argument we use here, right? Okay, well, uh, there are several problems with that. Let me suggest one to you. The Hebrew word, which was coined, I suppose, perhaps 3,000 years ago, several languages have intruded between Hebrew and what we call Russia. The Russians don't call it Russia. They have their own word for that, their own language, right? So he said, well, it sounds like that. (laughs) I said, yeah, it does. I mean, this is the level of discussion, you see. I mean, it's just insane. It's insane. But the reason, as I said, he can get away with that is because we don't know anything about this. We think, well, gosh, he's a scholar. I guess he must know. No, he's trying to use things, limited ways, to make things I think that are just ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. So what, what it always told me when I first read that, I thought, I need to read more about this. I've got to find out about this. So I read tons of stuff about Revelation. I went through the book, the Greek book. It's really weird Greek. It, it, some of the times the subjects and verbs don't agree, which is a terrible thing in Greek to have happen. I think the guy probably, probably his first language is probably Hebrew, and he probably wrote this as a second language, most likely as Greek, because Greek is not very good. It's really quite poor. Uh, but nonetheless, the point he's trying to say is really quite simple. The empire falls. Christ lasts forever. Jews. Choose. Don't fall in with the empire. The empire will destroy you, he says. Well, I think that may still be true. As I say, words to live by. Yeah, I say. That's true. Another question. Another question. Yes. Hmm. yes question. I like yes or no questions. Yeah, yes or no. Have you written a book on revelations? I have, I have not. I have a series of uh, videotapes that I did about, oh my goodness, a long time ago in Baton Rouge, actually. Uh, I was speaking to a church there. They videotaped them, and they kept them. I, and I don't have copies of them myself. They're in the old conference office, I think. And they may still be there, actually. But no, I've never written on Revelation. But I can tell you some books you can read that'll get at this in certain ways. I mean, there are, there are lots and lots of really good writings on Revelation now, uh, as long as, as one realizes they're being written by reputable scholars who have thought through these things with some care and know something about the way the language works and history works and all that. Yeah. One more quick question, and then... I think we probably ought to let Dr. Holbert go, but one more question. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, Gary, I'm going to bypass you if you don't mind, since I, I had you take, uh, thank you. No, okay. no, no, That's good. no, no, no. Yeah. Mm-hmm. About the decline yes. of the Methodist church. Indeed, yeah. Uh, from basically four million people. Yeah, about, yeah, uh, about, about almost five, actually. Almost have, five. Almost five, yeah, right. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Is in your experience of being around a lot of churches yeah. and a lot of people, what do you see as it is, what part of our discipline, what part of uh, our, our church yeah. is, I mean, too conservative, too liberal, yeah, too, right. I mean, where we, I mean, obviously we're mm-hmm. headed uh, somewhere in the next couple of years that a lot of us hate to see. Yeah. Um, yep. and just wondering what your right. thoughts are. Well, I, I, I have only have thoughts. I mean, I, don't, I certainly don't have any great keys to any of this. I mean, I, I have witnessed this in my own life and ministry to watch. Now, as you know, being where we are now tonight, and, and I've lived in Dallas now for nearly 50 years, um, you would not see much of this uh, in places like that because the churches are very strong in Dallas. I mean, the church on the campus at SMU, Highland Park, United Methodist Church, has 15,000 members. And it hasn't lost many members at all. It's got a staff of 15 clergy and 85 uh, lay workers. So, I mean, it's a big thing. And it's very active, and it's very successful, and it's very powerful. Uh, and, and other churches in the city of Dallas could be seen in the same kind of way. We, I don't see a lot of decline there, really. Um, the decline, I, I think, I, and again, I'm, I'm, my own judgment about this is, I think the decline of the church rests primarily on the question of, I have two, two things to say about it. One, I think people have lost their passion for the church. And I think that's true about a lot of leaders, too. They've, they've, they've become so company-oriented that they've lost their passion for the work, the sense that this is work that you only can do if you're passionate about it. I mean, it's, it's not like, 
if I, I mean, if I don't do this, I'll sell insurance. You know? Well, I, my father was an insurance agent, that's fine. But it's not the same thing. If, if I'm called to this work, the first thing I have to consider is the passionate energy that it takes to do it and do it effectively. And I must admit to you that uh, in all the teaching that I did at, at the School of Theology, that was the thing I could almost always tell. If a person was not passionate about this, I knew they were not going to be very helpful to people over time. And that happened. I mean, I certainly saw students who were not. They just sort of did this because they thought this is something they could do. That's one problem. The second problem is, as I said before, I think the United Methodist Church, of course, is a large organization with a huge superstructure. And when problems begin, it tries to maintain the same organizational structure with a far fewer people. And that's a problem, I think. With this large hierarchy that we have, with the responsibility out of Nashville to follow certain kinds of, give us information and give us sort of ideas and give us stuff to read and study and all that. It's now, it's become almost impossible for them to do the work that they've been called upon to do. And what that means to me is, I think we need a whole different way of thinking about this, a very different way of ordering the church. That's an enormous problem, I know. I mean, it, it, I can, the, the thought of it is just staggering to me. But I know that we cannot go on the way that we are structurally, I don't think, and expect the same things to happen. And I don't think it's going to be a question of we ought to have the right kind of worship necessarily, the right kind of music. Uh, I do think uh, that people have lost their connection to the biblical story almost completely, which I think is a terrible problem, a big problem. But that's part of the society too, isn't it? I mean the society has become increasingly secular over those same years, hasn't it? We now have nearly 30% of our population who say that they are none. They have no religious connection at all. That's very high, 30%. In the, in the U.S., it's so much lower for so many decades, but now it's high. So all that means, there's a, there, if you will, a kind of tsunami of questions and ideas that are making it very difficult to find out what we need to be doing. But I do know this. There are churches in the United States, in nearly every state, that are vibrant and lively and engaging and are speaking the gospel with power. I know that because I've seen them. I know that. And those are the churches that are going to make things happen continually. I don't believe the church is going to disappear at all. But I do believe the church is going to have to find its way in this increasingly secular world, and passionate leadership is what's going to help do that. I think. I think that's true. And I would also add to that, to, an, to answer more specifically and um, kind of hide behind Dr. Holbert a minute, is in our denomination, there are vibrant churches all along the theological spectrum. Absolutely. Yeah. There which are. again is why I choose to be United Methodist because we're mm -hmm. a, such a big umbrella. Yeah, you can right. have conservative yeah. churches, you can yeah. have progressive yeah. churches, and you can have some all right. along. Right. And there are plenty yeah. that are failing all along, and mm -hmm. there are plenty that mm -hmm. are thriving all along. That's right. Good. That's but a good we church. just gonna, we yeah. have to get back to that to yeah. learn in the biblical yeah. story and get on fire for sharing yeah. the word of God. Right. Am I right? Yeah. All I mean, right. That, well, that, thank that, Dr. Holbert right. once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bless you all. Bless your ministry. Thank you. Thank you.